Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so today we will talk about micro cavities that employ a combination of distributed Bragg reflection and total internal reflection to combine light. And specifically, we'll kind of give a few more notes on the distributed Bragg reflector type cavities, DBR micropost cavities, like the ones here that you also studied quite a lot in your homework, and photonic crystal cavities such as the ones shown here that employ uh, distributed drag reflection in two dimensions and total internal reflection in, in the remaining dimension. So these cavities are interesting because as you see from here, um, even in these outdated results, they have very small mode volume, much smaller than any other cavities, but their Q factors, although now they're, by now they're much higher than the ones that are given on this plot, they're still not as high of a Q factor, they don't have as high of a Q factor as the uh, whispering gallery mode resonator cavities. So their Qs are kind of moderate, you know, on the order of millions at best, as you'll see later on, uh, but they have very small mode volume because they employ distributed drag reflection and that's very useful for um, a number of applications, including a light matter interaction, right? Cavity QED reduction in laser threshold and so on, uh, some of which we already discussed. So let's start with DBR micropillar cavities or DBR micropost cavities. These are uh, cavities that you analyzed in your homework that employ distributed Bragg reflection in one dimension and total internal reflection in the remaining two dimensions. So you basically start, you have two distributed Bragg reflectors that are grown uh, by molecular beam epitaxy and you have some kind of spacer region at the center where you would support uh, a confined electric field. And uh, of course, you have to confine structure laterally. So you typically etch these cylindrical shapes and uh, in these uh, horizontal directions, you confine by total internal reflection. So you've done that quite a lot in the homework, but in the homework, you didn't really analyze these cavities um, numerically or using some more accurate methods. You just used total internal reflection for uh, the axial propagation. And then you kind of truncated the field at the edges of the structure. And today we'll see a little bit more accurate methods that give you better field profile in lateral directions, um, right? So combination of transfer matrix method and, and uh, solution for uh, lateral confinement. Uh, so, so we'll see how the field profile looks in the radial directions. Uh, and then also we will see um, how, um, you know, feel this confined here and what types of Q factors you can reach uh, from numerical simulations, uh, which we will also discuss on, on Monday, on sorry, on Tuesday. Uh, so these particular cavities um, have uh, found a lot of practical applications. They're used in vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. So these are lasers that are used quite a lot in optical communications. They're also used in cell phones for uh, face recognition, facial scanning. Uh, you have pixels inside of iPhones, for example. Um, and uh, um, they're also, uh, again, used for communications, either in optical interconnects or in optical communications. And uh, this here is basically the first pixel array, which was made um, by Bell Labs many years ago, uh, I think in late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but since then, people have, of course, moved them to a variety of other materials and, and different wavelengths. Although there are still some, some practical challenges, in particular with building vessels for telecommunication wavelengths, but we will not really go into details of that. So how would you make something like this? Uh, you start from a wafer that you grow by molecular beam epitaxy or uh, MOCVD. Um, metal oxide chemical vapor deposition. You grow DBRs, um, for example, in this case, based on gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, which have refractive index contrast. Um, then you grow spacer region. Spacer region will contain some active layer, quantum wells or quantum dots in this case. And then you grow top layer. And uh, then you actually do some, some lithography, um, etching to define mask, and then after etching, you etch out these pillar arrays that, like the ones that we showed before, that could be used as surface emitting lasers or uh, single photon sources and so on. So here are the pictures of that. Uh, this is a DBR stack, which is grown uh, across the whole vapor by, in this case, molecular beam epitaxy, and you also see the spacer region, which in this case has quantum dots as active la layer, but you can also work, of course, with quantum wells, and typically lasers, um, including the ones in cell phones, have quantum wells. 
Um, and then after, uh, so here are the quantum dots on the left side. Uh, we discussed them when we talked about cavity QED earlier on. And then after etching, um, you produce these pillars here and each of the pillars has stack on top and on bottom and it has space and region in between. And in this case, these pillars have very small diameter and they're used as single photon sources, but for, uh, Vixels for vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, you would typically use much, much larger diameters. And we mentioned when we talked about thresholds for these lasers, uh, I mean, as you see here, it's few microns at least. Um, uh, when we talked about thresholds, that they would be in, at least in the hundreds of microwatts range. Uh, so it's pretty large threshold and small spontaneous emission coupling factor, beta factor. So um, how would you solve this problem more accurately than what you already did in the homework? So again, you are familiar with this problem. We just want to give a couple of additional notes. Uh, you looked into this problem already. Uh, you looked into the problem where you have a cavity, you have a quarter wave, uh, quarter wave stack on top and on bottom. <clears throat> and these quarter wave stacks, as you remember, are produced by stacking uh, materials of different refractive indices and H and high, high index and low index. Um, and you pick actually thicknesses that are exactly quarter wavelengths inside of these um, materials. And that would produce something that is a really good reflector at the wavelength lambda. Lambda is a free space wavelength. And then you produce some spacer and that would combine light. And you have that in homeworks already. Of course, it doesn't have to be precisely quarter wave stack. I mean, this is kind of rule of thumb works really well for planar stack of infinite width uh, laterally. We'll see that you can actually make corrections to that to design better resonator uh, in a moment, but that's generally a good rule of thumb uh, for starting with the design of these structures. So if you look at just one dimensional problem, which is what you did with transfer matrix method, and you look something that has high and low index uh, stack, quarter wave stacks on two sides and the spacer region, and this would be a full wavelength um, uh, cavity inside of the high index region. So this here is a profile of refractive index uh, as a function of distance, and this is a field profile. This is what you actually had also in your, your homework earlier on, and this full wave cavity in high index material produces this field profile electric field profile, which has maximum <clears throat> at the center of the cavity. And people often use this particular mode for building a laser uh, or for, build, I mean, in the vertical direction or building a single photon source because you have maximum of the field at the central region, at the very center of the cavity. If you make a half wavelength cavity uh, in the central region based on high index, um, you would actually have the mode that would have minimum of electric field at the very center of that spacer. So this is one half of the thickness here. And if you make the cavity uh, that has a spacer that is one half wave, wave thick, but in the low index region, so you see here uh, refractive index profile, that would have a maximum of the electric field at the center of this spacer. So there, the point of this is that there are many different ways of making a cavity. As long as you introduce some kind of perturbation in the central region, that would localize light because you would have reflectors on two sides. Of course, they may have different field distribution, different quality factors. However, I mean, you cannot really pick arbitrary spacer uh, uh, type and spacer thickness because you are usually constrained by other um, uh, constraints of, of your system design. Uh, for example, here, right, if you look at this particular cavity, which is half wavelength in the low index material, you may say, well, this is great because at the central region, I have a uh, maximum of the electric field and mode volume of this should be actually smaller than the mode volume of the cavity that I analyzed in the homework, uh, because field seems better localized in, in this case than in the first case. Um, and that is true. But then there are other issues with using this type of cavity. You have to remember that here you're using gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide as the materials. And for uh, uh, aluminum arsenide is also indirect band gap semiconductor and uh, gallium arsenide is the material that's used as barrier for your quantum wells. So your quantum wells are, have to be embedded naturally in gallium arsenide as the environment, not in aluminum arsenide. Uh, so, so when you're designing your cavity, you have to keep that in mind because wherever your quantum wells are, and that's your material emitting light, you need to have gallium arsenide, which is a high index material, right? And you also need to have 
maximum or strong field intensity so that these quantum wells can interact with the field. So this particular option at the bottom is out of question because you have low index material there, aluminum arsenide, and your quantum wells are not hosted by aluminum arsenide. Then you can actually look at this middle picture here and say, okay, but this is good because I have high index material in the spacer, yes, gallium arsenide, and my quantum wells are hosted by gallium arsenide. So maybe this is better because it's a half wavelength spacer, not full wavelength spacer. So mode volume would be also smaller, right? But what's the problem with this particular design? What do you think? Any thoughts? Uh, the maximum is on the edge. Exactly. So maximum is on the edge. Maximum uh, of the, uh, the electric field is on the edge, not in the middle. And uh, um, in practical case, you, you just putting your quantum well exactly at the interface between gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide would affect the quality of that quantum well. You don't want, to, want it to be close to the surface because you will have a lot of non-radiative effects. So this design would also not work for practical reasons, not because there is no cavity here. So that's what you have to keep in mind. And now let's actually go back to this particular design here um, and see how the um, how more accurate electric field distribution will look for this particular problem, right? So in reality, you know, you only in your homework use transfer matrix method and you look at how field was confined, you know, by using a stack of gallium arsenide and aluminum arsenide, which had infinite width laterally. And when you did that, you basically just solve for, for what I was showing here. Right, so this profile uh, for the structure that would not have any lateral confinement. And if you look at the real system, that would basically just correspond to electric field distribution along the axis of your cavity. In real system, you have lateral confinement as well, which was not taken into account in the previous analysis. And if you run numerical simulation of these cavities, your field profile would look something like this, right? So this is a pillar, cross section of the pillar, which is cylindrical. Along the axis, you will see something that looks like your uh, transfer matrix method solution. But in the lateral direction, you will also have some confinement. In this case, that would look like a Gaussian mode, but what type of profile you have laterally depends on what mode laterally you are exciting. And uh, if you decompose this electric field into uh, components that are parallel to a stack and a component that's perpendicular to stack, this is what you would see, right? So a component parallel to stack uh, would kind of look like the uh, solution that we had from transfer matrix method. And then there is also this perpendicular component, uh, which we didn't really have when we solved you, the problem using transfer matrix method. And the reason why you have also this perpendicular component is because now you uh, are solving the problem with lateral confinement. So it's not really any more one dimensional problem, it's a three dimensional problem. And you see that on the axis, you don't really have that perpendicular component, you just have parallel component. But then when you kind of move away from the center uh, towards the edges, you have more and more of this perpendicular component. And that's again coming from the lateral confinement. So here, this is one way of solving the problem. You solve it numerically. This was solved using finite difference time domain method. We'll talk more about it next week on Tuesday. Uh, you can also use finite element method. I mean, in this case, it was solved in cylindrical coordinates so that you basically just saw one slice of the structure, but assume cylindrical geometry. Um, but that includes numerical methods, right? So the question is whether you can solve the problem uh, approximately using some, some methods that are uh, simpler that do not really require you to have a commercial software or write your own software. And there is a way to find a more accurate uh, distribution of the field, and I'll show that to you in a moment. And, and to act kind of relatively accurately predict the resonances of the system. So before we go there, I, I just want to show you this. So this is from the numerical solution of the problem. This is a pillar. Um, again, um, same type of structure that we analyzed before. One wavelength thickness at the center, quarter wavelength stack on top and on bottom, kind of fundamental mode in the lateral direction, which looks like a Gaussian. And if you look at the, how the field looks as a function of time, uh, this is electric field profile as a function of time, heavily saturated or plotted at a low threshold so that you can actually see what's going on. This is, this is what you will see, right? So it's a kind of oscillates in time um, with the frequency two omega, if you are looking at the energy in the electric field. Uh, and also uh, you uh, will see some, some field uh, kind of, uh, or some, some radiation at the top of the structure, okay? And uh, uh, this radiation at the top of the structure that you see is the reason also why 
kind of the primary uh, emission direction for these structures, uh, which is why we use them in surface emitting lasers, because if you make this pillar array in the chip, it would kind of radiate in the vertical direction. So if you kind of have put your Vexel inside of your phone, it would emit light, laser would emit light in the direction perpendicular to the chip. And that's why you use it for your laser scanning, right? Uh, it's a different type of, of uh, uh, laser relative to the ones that would be built based on micro disks or micro rings that would emit light primarily in a lateral direction and would be more useful for building integrated circuits. So these ones are surface emitting. Um, and if you put something like a fiber on top, you can also couple well to the fiber. But the other thing that you can actually see here, which is also interesting, is that in the lateral direction, kind of transverse direction, there is also uh, some, some loss that you may see. Uh, and that loss is loss that is coming from imperfect confinement by total internal reflection. And that's what will limit Q factor of the structure eventually, especially if you make small diameter structures. So um, if you don't make your structure well, right? If you don't have perfectly vertical wall profile, um, as you see here, or if you don't etch deep enough, you will have even more loss as, as shown in this particular picture. So you'll see that now you have more radiation both into the substrate and in the transverse direction. Um, this is just highlighting that it's important. Uh, I mean, even in a structure with perfect, perfect cylindrical profile, you have transverse loss, but you'll have much more if you have any imperfections, any deviation from the vertical wall profile, insufficient edge depth, which makes the problem of making high Q resonators in this system more challenging because you have to edge something pretty deep uh, five micrometers at least in order to have sufficient number of mirror pairs on top and on bottom. Um, and you also have to make sure that you have very nice vertical wall profile or your quality factors would be dramatically degraded. And this becomes more critical as you go to small diameter structures because in larger diameter structures, your field is a little bit um, more isolated from the interfaces. So how do you solve problem more accurately than what you did in the homework? Um, well, you, in homework, you did transfer matrix method. And that's something that you can write easily in MATLAB and you actually yourselves probably wrote uh, code to solve field using transfer matrix method. So that's a relatively simple approach. Uh, but that doesn't capture lateral transverse confinement when you etch structures with finite diameter. So in order to solve for the transverse profile and lateral confinement, what we can do is we can decompose the total field into radial distribution and distribution along the axis of the pillar. So that's written here. So the whole field is basically expressed as a product of the field that you would obtain from transfer matrix method distribution in the Z direction along the axis and then transverse distribution in R and Pi directions and this is in cylindrical coordinates is another component that you have to find. So how uh, would we solve this problem? Um, this is following the reference at the bottom. Uh, first, you solve the problem in exactly the same way that you solved it in your homework, um, in variety of homeworks. Uh, so you take this structure, you take stack, and you find EZ of Z, which is the distribution along the axis, just from transfer matrix method, okay? So you just find the field distribution from transfer matrix method and you will obtain something that looks like pictures that I showed you before. This, right, what you already had in your homework. So that gives you axial distribution. That's EZ of Z. When you find that, then you calculate this effective index of the system. And this is different from effective index that we had before, but it's kind of a similar concept you would like to remove variation of refractive index in the axial distribution when you're solving it in the transverse direction. So what you do, you find the effective index by, by looking in this integral. Um, you are kind of averaging refractive index by taking into account distribution of your electric field that you found from transfer matrix method. Uh, so this is n times mag magnitude squared of E divided by integral magnitude squared of E. That gives you some an, an effective. And then in the second step, you solve for the uh, ER of R and phi uh, transverse distribution by solving the field distribution inside of the cylinder that has the same radius as the micropillar that you already so um, that you are solving for, uh, same as the, the cavity you are solving for, but there is no DBR stack. You replace the whole cylinder with an effective. Okay, and to solve this problem. 
uh, you basically solve it in the same way that we solved it when we were looking into micro disks solutions, right? Or you um, can open any textbook and look at the solutions of, of fibers and cylindrical geometries. Um, I mean, here is one reference here is optoelectronics, but any optoelectronics book has solutions of this uh, wave propagation in cylindrical geometry because that's what's used for, for fibers. And solutions, as you know, would be some kind of vessel functions because we had that also for modes of a micro disk when we solved modes of the micro disk. Although there we focused primarily on specific higher order M azimuthal number modes. And here, um, it's the same family of modes, but we will focus on the modes that have very small azimuthal number because those are kind of the fundamental modes that we're seeing here. So for example, for the mode that I showed you here, which is referred to as the HE11 mode um, of the micro disk, and it's the same as the HE11 mode of a fiber for those of you who had fiber optics before, the lateral distribution of the field, transverse distribution of the field in the, in the transverse direction would be described with the Bessel function of the zeroth order. So something like J0 of beta R. And that comes from the solution of the wave equation in the cylindrical geometry with N effective. So- um, One question. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Why we can do the effective uh, median theory on the rack? How, how can we do it? It is not, it is an approximation and actually effective index uh, approximations normally don't work. But in this particular case, I'll show you comparison. It works well only for calculation of the field profile in the transverse directions, because you're just finding the component. Uh, field is primarily confined in the spacer region and uh, your, it kind of is dying away as you, as you hit the mirrors. So solving for cylindrical geometry would give you the lateral confinement of the field. Uh, well, right, because that's just total internal reflection, right? So what you're, you're missing piece is total internal reflection. That's basically why, why it helps you. And, in, and you, as you've seen a moment, actually, it also gives pretty um, uh, good um, estimate of the sh shift in the wavelength that comes from the lateral confinement. Yeah, but it is not accurate solution because even decomposition of the field into product of these two components, axial and radial, is not accurate. But it works approximately. Okay. So, so field profile again would be product of this axial distribution times lateral distribution that you obtain from the cylinder. And again, for the H one one mode is J zero. Uh, Bessel function of the order zero of some coefficient beta that I'll explain in a moment times the radius. Um, and, you know, of course, if you are talking about this particular mode, which has this radial distribution of Jz zero of beta r, uh, you see that the field has to go to zero pretty much at the interfaces, the same thing as what we did for micro disk. So, if, so you can actually obtain this beta um, coefficient from the boundary conditions by saying that your um, lateral distribution of the field or your electric field drops to zero when your radius is equal to radius of your pillar, right? So when you go to this point here, which is the edge of the pillar, then your field has to drop to zero, which means that the radial distribution has to drop to zero because your axial distribution is uniform everywhere in that plane. And if your radial distribution drops to zero, that means that this whole um, index of the Bessel function has to be equal to some specific zero of the Bessel function. So for example, if you pick first zero of the Bessel function J zero, and this is very similar to the discussion that we had for micro disks, right? Except that we're working with smaller numbers for, for uh, M. So if you pick first zero of Bessel function J zero, then uh, practically beta is S zero one divided by a radius of the pillar, okay? And that gives you the number that you would use here, index that you would use here when you're plotting electric field distribution. If you pick a different mode, and of course, you know, in the cylindrical geometry, same as in the micro disk, you can have many different modes. If you pick, for example, HEMN mode, and this HE is short for hybrid electric, kind of primarily TE-like mode of the system. It's adopted from, from fibers. If you pick HEMN mode, which is what we also had when we looked into micro disks, then um, a transverse distribution of the electric field would be proportional to Bessel function uh, of m minus one, order m minus one, 
of coefficient beta r, right? So this is just the notation that people use for what m and n correspond to. We, I know we used previously for t, e, m, n mode, Bessel function j, m. Here for h, e, m, n mode of the micropillar is Bessel function of the order m minus one, right? So don't get confused. It's almost the same, but just the way people decided to uh, numerate these modes is different between micro disks and, and micro pillars. So for h, e, m, n mode, it's j, m minus one, Bessel function of beta r. How do you find beta? Same story, right? This argument, beta r, when r is equal to rho, radius of the pillar, has to be equal to some zero of the Bessel function, and you pick n to zero of Bessel function m minus one, okay? So your factor beta is s m minus one n divided by radius of the pillar. Does that make sense? Is this okay? Any questions? Okay, so now you have that coefficient, right, beta, and you have radial distribution or, or transverse distribution of the problem. Um, one more thing that you can find from this is a correction on the wavelength of the mode once you etch smaller diameter structures. So in your homeworks, when you built cavities, you would pick quarter wavelength stack on top and on bottom, and you pick one uh, full wavelength, for example, spacer in a high index material, and that gives you a resonance at the wavelength uh, for which you pick to build that stack. But then when you etch that out um, into a pillar of smaller diameter as the movies and pictures that I showed you, there will be a blue shift in the wavelength relative to the wavelength that you found in the structure in the cavity of the infinite diameter. And you can expect blue shift, sh uh, blue shift from the discussions that we had previously because uh, from the variational theorem in electromagnetics, for example, um, your electric field profile in the structure of finite diameter like the one here in lateral direction would overlap more with air. And if overlaps more with air, that would actually shift wavelength to lower wavelengths, right? And frequency to higher frequency, right? Because your field profile simply overlaps with low index region. It's not all in the high index region inside of the, inside of the cavity. But the actual shift can also be predicted from the method that we just had from the decomposition of the mode into something that is um, uh, localized in the vertical direction by distributed direct reflection and laterally by total internal reflection. And this blue shift or shift in the wavelength can be uh, found from the simple expression here uh, from the product. I mean, if you express your field as the product of two field components. Uh, if separation of variables is possible, which we assumed here that they approximately holds, and you plug that back into the wave equation, you, you can derive that the total k vector of the system is sum of uh, k vector for um, your field, which is calculated from transfer matri matrix method, and beta factor, which is basically your kind of imaginary k vector for the field that's confined by total internal reflection. So this expression here, holds, right? And uh, if that expression holds, then you can actually plug in k0, which is just obtained from transfer matrix method. Basically, you designed uh, wavelength for wavelength in a planar cavity, which is lambda naught. Uh, you found the effective index of the system, and in your k naught is 2 pi n effective divided by lambda naught. Um, and then you found beta from the boundary conditions in the lateral direction. Uh, you add them up together and that gives you k of the system and k of the system can also be written as 2 pi n effective divided by lambda, the new lambda wavelength, which is corrected for the lateral confinement. So when you put all of these together, uh, you can just write that one over lambda squared is one over lambda naught squared plus beta divided by 2 pi n effective squared. So everything is just divided by 2 pi here. So wavelength, when you have a finite diameter, um, which is lambda, will have to be smaller than wavelength when you have infinite diameter because of this additional factor described with beta over two pi n effective, which comes from the lateral confinement, right? So in the structures of smaller diameter, you will have a blue shift relative to the planar cavity. And that comes from total internal reflection confinement. So let's see how accurate that blue shift is. So this plot here uh, from the same paper shows these lines, solid lines that are calculated plots of exactly this right, calculated for different modes and different modes to different, have different betas calculated from different Bessel functions. And dots here or squares correspond to experimental measurements for 
experimental results for resonances uh, of different uh, micropillars. Horizontal axis gives you radius, okay, radius of a micropillar, which goes from 500 nanometers to three microns. And here is a energy shift or frequency shift of the wavelength. So this is positive frequency shift or energy shift, which is basically talking, uh, giving you uh, a blue shift of the wavelength, wavelength goes down. And if you look at this uh, HE11 mode, the one that we analyzed first, which people typically would like to work with, uh, the fundamental one that has maximum at the center and along the axis would be this, this particular curve, the lowest curve, that's the fundamental mode. And then other combinations of, of uh, uh, M and N and going to HE and EH modes, which, which have TM components dominant, would lie on different curves. So looking into this, you know, you see that all of these experimental results lie pretty well on the curves, which means that the approximation that we introduced here for the blue shift of the wavelength is, is pretty good, right? It gives you a pretty good estimate. So what can you, what can you also conclude from this? As you go to a very large radius, right, all of these curves kind of converge together, right? Is that expected? It is expected because as you go to infinite structure, right, infinitely wide structure, there is no lateral confinement anymore, right? So you just go back to whatever you analyze with your transfer matrix method. All of these different modes and all of these different curves just correspond to different field profiles in transverse direction. And as you go to smaller and smaller radii, there is more and more blue shift, more and more of change of the wavelength as a function of the radius. And that's also expected, right? Because you are um, having more and more effect of the surrounding air region and confinement and your field penetrates more and more into the air region. The other things that you can conclude from here is that when you go to very small radius of the pillar, right? Like 500 nanometers in this case or so, uh, you will support only one mode, HE11 mode. That's the one that I plotted in movies. But then when you go to large diameter pillars, then you can actually support many different modes. So when you build VIXEL, vertical cavity surface emitting laser, and you have few microns of diameter, all right, uh, at, which would be basically somewhere here, you are operating in a multi-mode regime. So when you buy VIXELs, it would, would typically be a, a, a multi-mode structure and you have to do something special to, to make sure that it operates in a single mode regime. But then when you make it with a very small diameter, then it would actually always operate in a single mode regime. And that mode would be HE11 mode that we plotted before, which is very, very easy to couple to five. So in comparison, I mean, if you look at the numerical solution for the electric field distribution, um, uh, which I, yeah, go on, you should. Um, um, so um, you say HE11 mode is easier to couple into fiber? Yes, uh, just because we normally also in fibers, you want to operate in that fundamental mode. HE11 is also the mode that is typically used in fibers, right? Uh, the fundamental mode. It's the same notation as in the fiber. It has this Gaussian profile. Right. Uh, I mean, if you are coupling from this to a fiber, you would have some sort of Gaussian uh, field profile here, and that can also very well couple to a fiber at the output, as opposed to some complicated field profile that you would have from photonic crystal cavity that wouldn't really couple very well over have that wouldn't have a very good overlap with modes of the fiber. This one has very good overlap with modes of the fiber because. There is a mode in the fiber, right, which is also called HE11, which pretty much has the same field distribution as this particular mode. So the modal overlap is very good. I just guess if this is pixel, then if this is fiber, then we need to put some like grading to couple. Into no, no, no. I'm talking. Okay, so I'm talking about the fiber whose axis would be aligned with the axis of this pillar. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, normally you think about fibers, fiber tapers that you're laying down on the chip. You're right. But this is a different geometry, right? This is surface emitting geometry. So you're using, if you're coupling this from fiber, your fiber would exactly be on top of this, right? Mm. And also, you, as I said, you use this for surface emitting laser, right? When you activate your face scan, like face recognition on your iPhone, there is a laser basically, I mean, it's kind of positioned at the top of your screen, right? Which is scanning uh, your face. And that's a big soul because it's a surface emitting laser. On-chip integrated laser wouldn't work very well because it would couple somewhere in plane of the chip. This shoots light out of the plane of the chip. 
Okay, great. So, um, so that's um, the discussion of different modes in the system and then comparison between numerical solutions. So this is a full three-dimensional numerical analysis using time domain method, finite difference time domain method. So here we're just showing one half of the cross section in the central region. And on the left is the solution from the transfer matrix method that we, we, we just introduced, right? So it's not exactly the same as transfer matrix method that you had before. That's the first step of the process, but then you also have to calculate for the lateral confinement from this effective index and cylindrical geometry. So this lateral confinement here would be Bessel function of the order zero, because this is for the H311 mode, but it could be another Bessel function for another mode. But what is important to point out is that also in the field distribution, there is a pretty good uh, um, overlap, right? I mean, it's, it's a pretty good estimate. If you're interested in just looking at the field profile inside of the structure, you can estimate it pretty well from this corrected transfer matrix method. And if you're interested in the estimated wavelength of the mode, this method also works very well, as we showed from this. So that's kind of a simple method that allows you to design the laser or your structure without access to sophisticated numerical methods. So just going back to you know, what we already said, if you have a large diameter structure as, as shown here, so this is a diameter of six microns, right? So radius of three microns. This is what we would expect there. Heavily multimode regime. If you measure luminescence from this structure with six micron diameter, you see a mess of modes, right? There are a lot of modes and here internal photoluminescence from quantum dots embedded in the structure was used. And um, you can still identify from this comparison all of these different modes, right? But there are a lot of them, that's, that's the bottom line. And the lowest energy, lowest frequency one is H311. So that's this, this particular curve. So if you wouldn't like to have this mess of modes inside of your system, then clearly you have to make a smaller diameter structure. It goes to the left on this curve, right? And to do that, you, uh, you can actually, if you do that, you can see that already it becomes cleaner. So this is diameter of four microns, diameter of one micron, and in diameter of one micron, you are basically somewhere here uh, in the single mode regime. This is, these are some other things that are, that are happening here at higher frequencies, but not high Q resonances. Um, people have done a lot of exciting work with this, you know, apart from pixels which have commercial applications, um, even in uh, light matter interaction, cavity quantum electrodynamics, you know, people have done a lot of work with these systems. And uh, in particular, the highest efficiency single photon sources are based on these particular uh, systems because as we were just discussing, it's pretty easy to collect emission from on top of the structure. So you have pretty good collection rates directly off the chip. Um, and, um, uh, you know, you can also build relatively high Q cavities. People have shown strong coupling regime and so on. But collection efficiency is what helps you. So if you make photonic crystal cavity, for example, it's you need to collect as we'll discuss in a moment, in a lateral direction, and then you have to build kind of the whole circuit around, or you may need to put some sort of fiber tapers, but here, straight off the chip, you collect all of the light, right? And that's, that's what's very useful here. Um, and people have demonstrated also pretty high Q factors. I mean, this is uh, work, for example, from, from Germany, from Würzburg, um, where they shown Q factors exceeding 150,000. Of course, as you go to smaller pillar diameters, Q factors drop because of total internal reflection. Smaller diameters, same discussion that we had last time with respect to whispering gallery mode resonators. You confine light more tightly, there is a larger spread of K vectors and harder to confine light by total internal reflection. So same story here. Go to small pillar diameters, um, you confine light more tightly, and you start losing more and more in lateral directions by total internal reflection. Uh, but still, for decent diameters, you can have high Q factors. And the other actually important thing that I wanted to emphasize here is that um, uh, these high Q factors were achieved for a very, very large number of mirror pairs. They have 29 to 32 mirror pairs on top and 33 to 36 on bottom. And I already mentioned that you need to etch through pretty much all of them to see very good confinement so that you don't start seeing loss in the coupling to kind of mirrors at the bottom. So if you look at this and you remember that each mir mirror pair is something on the order of 200 nanometers uh, tick uh, from your homework, um, this is about 60 to, to 70 times 200 nanometers. 
Uh, so we're talking really about micrometers that need to be etched. And that's pretty hard, especially if you want to have very nice profile as here. That's a pretty hard problem because masks start degrading, right? In, uh, as you're etching the structure, um, it starts to heat up because this is a long, very long etch and um, that affects the, the etch profile. You see some undercut on some of the pillars that I showed you before. Also, there is a mask degradation for all the masks that you can deposit. You have to go to kind of multi-layer masks and even in this particular case, there is a mask erosion eventually because you're running out of mask here as you're actually continuing your etch. Um, so it's not a trivial problem, right, to especially make high Q small volume resonators. Uh, but if you are okay with having a moderate Q and decent volume, then you can actually make really good single photon sources in weak coupling regime. I had the question for you, right? So here they note mirror 29 to 32 pairs on top and 33 to 36 on the bottom. Why is the number of mirrors on top and bottom not the same? Any uh, thoughts? Since they have substrate on the bottom? They have substrate, but you know, you can actually still make the same number of pairs on top and on bottom. So why would they change it? What do you think? Why is it asymmetric, right? If it was symmetric, what would happen? I mean, you can still build resonators, right? But where would photons go? Both sides. Both sides, right? So when you build a laser or single photon source, actually you want your photons to primarily go upward, right? Which is why you put more mirror pairs at the bottom. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so great. So uh, yeah, that's what we were just discussing, right? And this is a pretty difficult uh, problem, you know, to solve. You have to etch deep structures and so on. Um, and then on the other hand, there are other ways of confining light by distributive red reflection by etching mirrors inside of the planar um, uh, struct plane of the chip, right? So that's what we'll be discussing now. Um, and we'll be discussing photonic crystal cavities and actually we'll start with two dimensional photonic crystal cavities and then make a brief mention of one dimensional lateral distributive red reflector cavities, which are nanobeam cavities. So after a brief break, um, this is what we'll be discussing here. Yeah, if there are any questions, I'm, I'm here, happy to take them. Excuse me. Um, yeah. I'm wondering why in the micro ring resonator we always yeah talk about m equal to one uh, in whisper carrying mode. That depends on uh, in, in the micro ring or micro disc. You're asking about micro ring. That depends on how wide micro ring is, right? So of course, if you make a thick ring, you can excite other ends. But if you make a thin ring, then you will not have material to excite higher order ends. Understand? Right, so there'll be only kind of one lobe excited in the lateral direction, in the radial direction. So, uh, why is why is depends on the thickness of the micro? Uh, thickness meaning I meant thickness in the radial direction, right? In the radial direction, the width and maybe width is more accurate uh, the description. The width of the ring in the radial direction here would determine which ends you can support. If it's very narrow ring, right? Yep. Then there will be only one lobe that you can fit inside of that ring. Okay. So that's n equal to one. Mm -hmm. And same for toroid. Uh, just wondering, is that because of loss? If yeah, we... yeah. I mean, in toroid, you could, uh, and or you're below cutoff for some of these modes, right? Because they are, you you are not able to support them. There is no material simply to support them. In a toroid, you may remember that we saw like n equal to one mode, right? It's the same story, n equal to or p equal to one mode from from the microsphere, which is the same as n equal to one here. 
which is kind of confined in the toroid, but then P, higher P, right, which are the same as higher N for micro disc, uh, because you had very, very thin material here, right, left, couldn't really be supported. There was no really material to support them. Yeah. You still need like uh, sufficient uh, width of the high index material to support them. Okay. So simply those solutions are eliminated in by, by this geometry where you take out material. Even in micro disk, right? If I if you think about higher order ends that would be supported here, right? If we have to have strong field around the pedestal. If you etch that away, they can't be supported, right? Uh, I have one question. Yeah, sure. Um, so you mentioned those pillars could be used for um, single photon generations. Um, yeah. How does that work? You just put us, I mean, a lot of references that I put here and also some more recent work, for example, from Paris, Pascal Senelar is uh, related to that. It's the same story. I mean, in fact, all those references that I showed you, like the calculations here is the same, are, are uh, primarily done for single photon sources and the structures I showed you before. But you uh, basically just have a single quantum dot here at the central region, right? So in the spacer region, instead of having a lot of quantum dots or a lot of quantum wells as you would have in a laser, you just have a single quantum dot, okay? And then you can excite that quantum dot with another laser at a higher energy. And then that quantum dot relaxes, emits a photon, which is coupled to the cavity mode you collected on top, right? But your laser, excitation laser, is at a very different frequency. In principle, you can make also P injunction to inject carriers, but that's pretty hard here. And people don't do it for single photon source. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, photonic crystal cavities, right? So we'll first start with, with distributed, uh, with two dimensional planar photonic crystal cavities, uh, which confine light by distributed Bragg reflection in two dimensions. And then remaining third dimension is total internal reflection. So just to remind you, we spent a lot of time talking about photonic crystals of this type. This is how the Venn diagram of uh, hexagonal lattice photonic crystal would look like without any defects, rearrangements is just the perfect periodic lattice. That's what we did in chapter two. And you have your dielectric and air bands and band gap and so on, right? But then when you start uh, introducing some defects inside of this structure, uh, like increase the refractive index of a single hole or remove it completely or increase the hole, which means reduce basically uh, refractive index of the structure, that would localize the field, right? So you can change the whole radius, you can fill it up with something else, erase the hole, and that would confine electromagnetic fields, right? So if you, for example, uh, increase refractive index of this hole, if you fill it up, with, if you erase a hole or reduce its radius, what that would do is that would increase the overlap of the field with high index region, okay? Because you're removing low index from, from the system. And if you increase the overlap with high refractive index from the variational theorem that we discussed before in electromagnetics, overlap with more high index pushes frequencies in what direction? More overlap with high index, what, what happens with the frequency? And this is pretty important because if you, yeah, it goes down, right? Yes. So, so if you, if I reduce the hole radius or erase a hole, all of these bands from the original photonic crystal would kind of go down, okay? And by how much they go down depends on how much they overlap with that particular hole, but you know, they're all pushed down. So the uh, conduction band donors, uh, con sorry, conduction band, right? Or air band states are pushed down into the band gap and they'll get localized to there, right? Um, the dielectric band states are also pushed down, but they're pushed away from the band gap and they're not localized. So when you do something like this, when you increase overlap with high index region, you will excite so-called donor type cavities, 
uh, and this terminology is introduced by analogy with, of course, semiconductor physics and condensed matter physics, where donor states, localized donor states, originate from the conduction band. So instead of air band mode, like the one that we have, instead we would have a localized version of that block mode that would look like this, and that's a cavity. If you increase the radius of the hole, opposite thing happens, and we'll see that in a moment, right? Because frequency goes up and all of these bands are pulled up, so you're localizing acceptor mode. Of course, this same discussion applies to waveguides. You know, you can erase a line of holes and that would localize field, uh, in this case, from the air band around that line defect and form a waveguide mode. I mean, we're in this class, we're not talking about waveguide modes. In the non-photonics class, Shanghui Fan is talking about waveguide modes, but uh, so we'll leave that discussion for there, but I just want to mention that that's exactly the same, the same idea. So how would you make this? We won't go into details. Fabrication is exactly the same as fabrication for planar photonic crystals. It doesn't really matter that you are here removing a single hole or shifting some holes around. Um, the bottom line is that the steps are the same, lithography etching, dry and wet etching, so it's basically done exactly the same way. Um, and you can undercut if you wish. And of course, since there are many different ways of introducing any imperfections, right? Um, you can do something like this. You can remove seven holes in this case. You can remove single hole in a square lattice. There are also many different ways of making cavities and you can make them in a variety of materials. And this whole idea of introducing cavities in photonic crystals is basically the same as localization of electron wave functions around impurities in, in uh, crystals or in semiconductors. Right? Because any impurity, if you in, in insert an impurity, if you in, in insert fluoride in silicon or any, anything, anything uh, different from the original atoms, that would be a perturbation in the periodic lattice, perturbation of periodic potential. It's a different atom, right? So that perturbs periodic potential and introduces localization of wave function. So your eigenstates of the system are not block modes anymore. They are localized versions of the block modes. So that's exactly the same idea, right? When you introduce perturbation into the lattice, you will introduce localization and your wave, wave functions are localized and those are cavity modes. Of course, arbitrary perturbation is not gonna be a good resonator. So you have to do something more than that. But, but the basic idea is that any perturbation localizes field. So to summarize you know, what we already discussed before, you know, recall electromagnetic variational theorem, more overlap with high index material, frequency would decrease, more overlap with uh, low index material, or if overall the electric constant decreases, frequency would increase, okay? And this is a very important thing to remember, you know, if you, I guess if you remember one thing from, from the class, this should be the top thing to remember because you can use this to explain a lot of things related to photonic crystals. I mean, even in today's lecture, you will be able to explain the origin of the resonances in photonic crystals, are they air or the electric band modes. You will be able to explain blue shift of the resonances in micro pillars. Um, a lot of different effects uh, that, you, the, that, that we discussed. So already two effects from today's lecture, right? So going back to photonic crystals, this is a band diagram for hexagonal photonic crystal, like the one that we discussed in chapter two. So, so normally, uh, eigenmodes of this are the electric and air band modes, block states. Each point here corresponds to a block state, right? But then if you start introducing imperfections, for example, if you increase high index by erasing a hole, as we already discussed, what happens? All of these block modes would overlap more with high index because you remove the single hole, right? So then now suddenly at this point overlap more with high index. That pushes all of their frequencies down. Everything goes down. And then the first one that goes into the band gap and gets localized is this first band, right? And of course, if you make a bigger perturbation, if you remove, for example, seven holes, you'll start bringing down higher order bands, but you need higher and higher perturbation in order to bring higher bands down, right? But you, in any case, need to increase their overlap with high index material, meaning you start erasing holes. And this is electric field distribution for this so-called dipole mode, and this is magnetic field distribution for that dipole mode. Does that make sense? What happens with the dielectric band, right, when I do this? Could you holes? explain about uh, how to apply variation theory on here? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it, right. So, so, I mean, it's just the main conclusion of what we had on the previous slide. If your field 
overlap so so that you have some electric field distribution or magnetic field distribution and you start from the original electric field distribution but then you start adding uh in this case increasing refractive index right delta epsilon is positive and that's basically what you're doing because at that hole you're filling up the hole with high index materials so you're increasing refractive index there an electric constant there that would imply and this is what we did actually you know uh, a couple of weeks back so i'm not rederiving it for that reason this is implying that your new frequency of the field uh, would be uh, lower than the original frequency okay does that make sense yeah 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 so filling up this hole here would basically just push the frequency down and you push the field into the band gap where it gets localized okay or a kind of baby picture of the whole thing is I have some central region and I put mirrors around and then field bounces in that central region. But we don't want to use that, that picture anymore. I mean, this is a much, much better way to explain things because this can also explain you the symmetry of the modes. And here you can actually see that this dipole mode based on symmetry originates from the lowest order airband. The next order mode that you would localize is for example, the one that I showed here here, right? And the symmetry of this mode is like the symmetry of a higher order airband. And for this, you needed higher perturbation. You needed to remove seven holes in order to bring that one into the photonic band gap. Of course, if you go in the opposite direction, if you increase the overlap with low index, how do you increase the overlap with low index in region? You make holes bigger, one or more holes, right? So you make, let's say, just simply make the central hole bigger. What does that do? So that's in overlap with low index region. If you go back to variational theory, increasing the overlap with low index would push frequency up. Okay, so you slowly, slowly start pulling your field, your 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 uh, photonic bands up, right? And that happens to both air and the electric band. Um, but the electric band is pushed up directly into the band gap where it gets localized, and you will produce these acceptor modes like like the one here. Your your donor modes are also pushed up but they're pushed away from the photonic band gap, right? So they're not localized. And also you have to keep in mind that these modes from the, the, the electric band are more affected by this than the air band modes. And that's because the electric band modes are originally localized in the electric, which you are suddenly replacing with air, right? While air band modes are kind of localized in air and where I had air, I still had air, right? So perturbation is much stronger for this perturbation affects the electric band much stronger and affects it in the right direction. And this perturbation affects air band modes much, much more because I fill up air with high index and air band modes are in air and they see that perturbation much more. Does that make sense? Uh, so I can understand that on the left hand side, a scepter um, will go to the band gap. And, but I'm, I didn't know why is that related to the isolation and localization. So, so what is the question? Why is it, do you understand why it goes into the band gap or no? Yeah, I, I understand this part, but. Okay, but you don't understand why it's localized. Yeah. Yeah, so what is happening here is the following, right? So that's, that's a good question, right? So you increase the radius of the hole, right? And that pushes your block states up, right? I mean, you can kind of view it, you make a small, increase in that hole, you, you push it up because the perturbation pushes frequency up. But you are not increasing all holes, you're just increasing one hole, okay? Which means that the whole surrounding region is just still has like some, still has the same band gap as the original lattice, okay? So in the region where I'm making perturbation kind of increasing locally the frequency of the block state but then everything around here is still the same so where am i pushing it i'm pushing it in this region i'm increasing the frequency and pushing it in the region where surrounding mirrors have a photonic band gap okay yeah i understand so it's yeah. localized okay and you know these states all of these states can be seen as the some approximately as block states that are uh, multiplied by some envelope. And you know, if you take classes that focus on semiconductor nanostructures, for example, I mean, you know, this is, this is similar to 
that picture is similar to slowly varying envelope approximation, right? When you localize kind of modes around the, the band edge by making heterostructures, structures, you can also approximate wave functions like with block states times the envelope, right? I mean, for those of you who've seen that, it's just, I'm just throwing an out. Uh, you can also tune frequencies of all of these modes, of course. I mean, there are, I already mentioned that there are many different ways of, of making resonators. These are two simplest ways, right? I mean, removing a hole or reducing radius of the hole and increasing hole. But even in that case, you can tune the radius of the hole. You know, you can kind of tune it between, um, if you assume that 0.3 times periodicity is the original surrounding photonic crystal, if you increase the hole relative to that, you would be exciting these acceptor type modes. If you reduce hole relative to that, you would be exciting donor type mode, like this one here. And you can actually tune its frequency as you're changing that hole radius. But in the process, you can also tune Q factor, and we'll see why Q factor changes. Because you know it, it's not a very simple picture, right? You're pulling it, shooting, pushing it into the band gap, but there is also a loss above the light line. So we'll see what actually affects the Q factor in a moment and talk about the Q factor design. But before we go there, maybe it's interesting to point out why frequency, and this is normalized frequency, periodicity divided by valence, which is basically proportional to frequency. Why is frequency going in this direction, right? So original unperturbed photonic crystal is at 0.3 times periodicity, right? So as I start making perturbation, as I start making hole smaller and smaller, right? frequency of this donor type mode goes down and down. Is this what you expect? And then acceptor mode goes up and up. So what is happening actually here? Why is it going in that direction? If you keep going here, where would it go eventually when radius is 0.3, when you remove the perturbation? Where is this going? And where is this going? Any thoughts? Like a final resonance. It's going back into the band, right? The electric and air band, right? So what I'm actually plotting there is exactly what we were illustrating with arrows here. As you start increasing this hole, you're pushing it from this air band up, right? And the more and more you're increasing hole, the more and more you're pushing it into the band. And then here, the more and more you're decreasing the hole, the more and more you're pushing it from, from the air band. So that's what's shown here. The more and more you decrease the hole, you're pushing it down from the air band. And this one, the more and more you increase the hole, you're pushing it up from the dielectric band. So this one would eventually go into the dielectric band. And this one would eventually go into the air band. Yeah. You see my, my pointer, right? Do you see my pointer on the screen or? Yeah. yeah. OK, good. OK, so OK. So just a few, few notes before we talk about ways to improve Q factor and you know a little bit of historical perspective on this. Uh, when people started working with photonic crystals, they kind of naively thought about 20 years ago. Uh, well, first they, they wanted to make three-dimensional photonic crystals, thinking that that would solve all the problems because you distributed red reflection in all directions, but they realized then that it, that's a very difficult thing to do, right? Um, and then they shifted to planar two-dimensional photonic crystals, but then in planar, photonic crystals, there is also total internal reflection. So at first people naively thought that, you know, any defect I make, any, you know, removal of the hole would work well as a cavity. But then in reality, it turned out that Q factors were not that good, right? And that's also shown in this plot. So if you remove hole, maybe you have Q factor of few hundred, or if you increase the hole radius is again, like maybe at best few thousand, but not very good, right? So these are some of the first experiments on the dipole type cavity from about 20 years ago. Um, and this was based on luminescence of embedded indium gallium arsenide phosphide quantum wells and Q factor was only 200. So it's a very small mode volume, right? Because it's localized by distributed bright reflection, but small Q factor. And this is a doubly degenerate dipole mode because dipole mode that I showed you before, the first one you pull down actually has two, two different modes uh, that are plotted here. So that's the one that we showed here on the plot. And you know, even if you, instead of removing hole completely, tune it, you know, just reduce it a little bit, maybe you can go at best to something on the order of a thousand. And then likewise, you know, about the same time, yeah, was there a question? Okay, so at the same time, you know, these are kind of first demonstrations of cavities in planar photonic crystals. Um, you know, people also uh, demonstrated this acceptor type cavity, right, and um, 
just looked at the coupling from silicon bakeite to acceptor type cavity. And this one also had a Q factor of about 500, right? which is not surprising um, because we're talking about this particular curve and this region of the curve where theoretically you predict Q of 1,000. But actually, when you look at this first work, and this is from Susumu Noda's group, and I will mention some of their more recent work in a moment, you know, they didn't really look very good. They had a lot of surface roughness and so on, so that degraded Q factor relative to the predicted value of 1,000. But nevertheless, 1,000 or 500 of Q factor is not good. I mean, that would filter out three nanometers of line width, so it's not a very good filter for dense, um, you know, mainline division multiplexing, demultiplexing communications. So what, what's the problem here? Why are Qs not better? Again, I said people naively thought it should just work, but they thought that it would work because they were just thinking about simple two-dimensional models of cavities. You have distributed Bragg reflection. If you analyze it two-dimensionally, you feel this confined, and I just add that mirrors and it works. Well, it's not like that, right? Because this is a finite thickness structure. So if you look at it in the vertical direction, uh, if you look at the slab, and this is just one half uh, of the, the, from half plane, from center of the slab above, there will be a uh, loss, right? And you see that loss here, right? So if you look at the same movie that we were showing on the left and you look at it in the vertical direction, there is radiation loss, okay? So where is that coming from? Where is this coming from? What, why do we see loss vertically? Any thoughts? What effect is responsible for this? Why is, you know, can I fix this by adding more mirrors laterally? By etching more holes, what do you think? it wouldn't actually get fixed by etching more holes. And you can actually see that from this movie. You see that holes actually in this cross section and you see that this originates from the center region. So etching more holes around is not gonna help with that. It would just help suppress this lateral radiation loss, but not this vertical loss. So this vertical loss actually comes from total internal reflection. And the reason why you have a lot of vertical loss is because if you look at this field pattern and you take Fourier transform of that, right? It would have a lot of Fourier components. It's not a plane wave. It has, it's very tightly confined in real space. So it will have a very large spread in K space of Fourier components. I mean, if you remember when we talked about Dirac delta function, if it's Dirac delta function in real space, basically it samples all equally all K space components. And if it samples a lot of K space components, that means that you can't confine them all under light line. Some of them will be above light line and leak out as they do leak out here. So if you go back to our band structure diagram, right? I mean, maybe that's another way to see what's going on. Where would a cavity be on this band diagram? How would you plot it? Can you plot it? Any thoughts? I mean, it would be at certain frequency, right? But what about K? Where is it in K space? So in K space, it would be a spread of Ks, right? Dominantly around certain po point in K space, right? So for example, this one here would be dominantly around X point of the band diagram here, but it would have a spread of Ks and a very large spread of Ks. And some of them would cross the light line here and leak out and cause radiation loss. So what if you plot this on the band diagram, this cavity on the band diagram, it would be a spread at certain frequency in the case space around the X point, and a large tail of that would cross the light line and leak vertically. And what you see in the movie is exactly that, that loss. Okay, so this is, this is what you saw here. That are all the K components that are not confined by total internal reflection and are going above the light line. Any thought, any questions about this? Okay. I hope that means that it's clear. <laughs> but please ask me questions because All right. uh, yeah, yeah, please. If, uh, if that's in YZ plane, uh, like the K vectors, uh, how it's defined? Is it in XY plane? Yes, yes, yes. Because this band diagram, when we plot it for two-dimensional photonic crystal, is in the XY plane. That's why actually you have a concept of the light line because you are projecting three-dimensional K vector on two D plane. So everything above the light line would have a real KZ and mm -hmm. would leak, right? Yeah. Yes. OK, 
okay, so how can you improve that? Well, then, you know, that you can start doing some per additional perturbations on the cavity in the attempt to control those key components about the lifeline, right? So you have to do some modifications. Cle it's clear from these movies that you have to do some modifications on the field pattern that would kind of confine these kick vector components below the lifeline, okay? So you, if you, I mean, you can say, well, you know, what would be the optimal cavity? If I go back to the band diagram here, you can say, well, you know, why don't I just pick one K component here at that frequency? I mean, that would have a perfect confinement, right? What's the problem with that? Would that be a good cavity? Efficiency is really bad. So the problem, so you have to think about it in the following way. If you pick one K component, if it's Dirac delta function in K space, what is it in real space? Uh, it will be spread out in spatial. Spread out, it's, in, it's not confined at all, right? So that's not a good cavity because it will have infinite mode volume, right? So you need to find a trade-off. I want a small mode volume, but the smaller the mode volume, the larger the spread in K space and the more of the leak uh, there is about the lifeline, right? So you have to kind of design the cavity in such a way that there is a, you know, the, the trade-off between how small mode volume is and how much of these components you have about the lifeline. And that's what people spent a lot of time doing. I mean, there's still, there is still some work uh, in, in that direction, although, you know, current photonic crystal cavities are pretty much at the absorption limit of the material. But uh, um, I'll just walk you through, through some of the early ideas. And the recent ideas are again in that direction, um, but, but with some, some more perturbations and improvements in the cavities. Um, and I'll show you some pretty much state-of-the-art results. So, so, so this is one example, how you can improve it from like 2000 for the dipole mode to something on the order of 12,000 by modifying the cavity in the vertical direction. And by, by stretching it in that direction, you're canceling out K vector components that are above the lifeline near K equal to zero. So you can actually improve Q factor without really modifying significantly the mode volume. And then this one for another type of the mode, right? It's the same story. You start from this is called L3 cavity. So you remove three holes, right? And when you remove three holes, you can have Q factor of around few thousand. And then when you start shifting these end holes, right, in the cavity, the shift of the end holes would start changing the field profile for the mode inside of the cavity. It's kind of like shifting slightly mirrors away. But that also changes the distribution of the field between positive and negative lobes, which we know defines the Fourier components of the field. Because when you're calculating Fourier components, you're the, the uh, amount of, of uh, energy that you have in positive versus negative lobes would matter. And as you are increasing the length of the cavity, you are improving the Q factor from something on the order of a few thousand to around 45,000. And eventually it stops working because you're hitting the air bed. And that's the measurement for exactly that type of the cavity. Um, I have a question for you. As you are moving these holes at the end, you see that wavelength of the mode increases. Is that expected? Yeah, variation theory. So, exactly. So this is the third thing where you can use variational, you know, theorem in electromagnetics that we introduced to explain the effect. Exactly, because you are increasing. If you shift it by a tiny bit, you are increasing the overlap of your mode with high index material, and that shifts the wavelength up. Okay. So keep in mind, right? There are a lot of interesting things that you can, a lot of things that you can explain by by recalling just just that one one thing. Um, and of course, you know, then uh, from the same group, uh, this was also from the group in Kyoto that uh, Susumono does. I showed some, th their early work with acceptor type cavity. This is L3 cavity where they improved Q factor to around 45,000. Here they changed cavity somewhat. So this is a heteros double heterostructure cavity. You know, another way to approach the design problem. Uh, confined mode in L3 cavity at best, you can actually get to something like 45,000. But then they started carefully looking in the electric field profile and they saw that in the electric field profile, they were kind of, you know, the, the profile had this, as it would hit the mirrors here, these holes, it would look like, like what is shown here in the bottom left corner. But on the other hand, that would actually cause some, some extra K vector components in the Fourier spectrum that would leak out and reduce the Q factor. And they, they concluded that it would be much better to design something that exactly looks as if 
you have a block mode which has a Gaussian envelope. Because if you have a block mode with a Gaussian envelope, right? So if you have block mode, which is sort of like a periodic function with a Gaussian envelope, then that would have the field distribution as shown here. And in the Fourier space, you know, if you go back to our band diagram, you know, where would that be, right? So, so where would a block mode modulated by Gaussian envelope be? How would it look in the case space, right? It would be at certain frequency in the band gap, right? And if you start from the block, block mode at the J point, uh, L3 cavity is a block, originates from block mode in the J point. So it's this one here, right? Um, it would have some, some spread in K space. So if you think about block mode in a J point in that one direction, J direction, it's kind of like sinusoid, right? So you have sine of Kx, which is multiplied by Gaussian, okay? So if you have a periodic function multiplied by Gaussian, what's the Fourier transform of that? Do you remember Fourier transforms? Because that tells you where it would be in K space, right? So if it's sine Kx, which where K corresponds to J point, right? That would kind of determine the center of the Fourier spectrum. And the Gaussian envelope in real space would determine the Gaussian envelope in the Fourier space, which would be the width of that. Does that make sense? So in case space, this mode would basically be a blob at frequency omega centered around J point, and it would kind of be strongest at the J point and die away following Gaussian. And there would be some tail as you cross this line, but small tail, right? So they said, well, if we design block state multiplied by Gaussian, then in the Fourier space, it would just be Gaussian envelope and it would die away here and have very small tail crossing the line line and very, very high Q factor, okay? So then the challenge was how do you design something that's kind of periodic function times the Gaussian, right? Which, which they, they wanted to do. And for that, they couldn't really just shift the ends of the, the, the L3 cavity because in, by shifting the ends of the L3 cavity, it was not exactly periodic function multiplied by Gaussian, right? There was some deviation discrepancy from that as you hit mirrors, which comes from, from the boundary conditions. But if they uh, do what they were showing here, if they start from heterostructure cavity, which is equivalent to heterostructure semiconductors, you kind of sandwich material that, that has um, all the bands shifted to lower frequencies between two mirrors that have all the bands at higher frequency, then this would be kind of more gentle confinement, right? This is just like a small mismatch between the modes in this region and this region. And that would allow you to design something that really looks like block state multiplied by Gaussian. Okay, and you expect to have a higher Q factor. So if you look at in this heterostructure type picture, uh, you know, originally you have a waveguide, but then when you actually modulate the region at the center, when you, for example, increase the periodicity by a little bit, all the modes in this central region would be shifted to lower frequency. Again, variational principle in electromagnetics. And then all the modes around would be at higher frequencies. So something that's excited in the central region would kind of not be able to couple to mirrors because there would be mismatch between the frequencies. And then they made this. And you know now how how really you know different this is from just just putting holes in the mirror. I mean, in order to make this and achieve this gentle confinement and not produce extra scattering and extra Fourier components in the mirror, they actually just control periodicity to 420 nanometers at the center and 410 nanometers in the mirror. So it's just 10 nanometers off in periodicity. And with that, they were able to basically localize light in this cavity region here with Q factor of 600,000 in that their first work. But then, you know, for the same type of cavity, I'm sorry, then they kind of kept working on this problem and designing even better mirrors, kind of dividing them in segments so that they are even closer and closer to block state, uh, which is multiplied by the envelope, Gaussian envelope. And to achieve that, they go to even multi-layer heterostructure cavity. So here you have kind of more recent designs where you have central region with one periodicity and then 415 nanometer periodicity in the next surrounding region and then 410 nanometer periodicity. So they inject this extra 450 nanometer periodicity in between and 
you know, this is a very, very fine tuning of the structure. And with that, they were able to go to Q factors of, of few millions. I mean, this is from, from uh, a while back, but now they're on the order of few millions already. And the whole point is that by doing this, you are controlling spatial field distribution. I mean, the bottom line here is that the spatial field distribution in real space determines K vector components and determines how much loss you have out of plane, right? And that's the, the limit of the Q factor because you can always control the in-plane loss by adding more layers of the mirror. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up. I think next time at the beginning, we'll just quickly quickly mention um, nanobeam cavities, which are one-dimensional planar photonic crystal cavities, and then talk about various uh, numerical uh, design methods. Yeah, Yishu, you had I a question? One question, last question yeah, about sure. uh, why uh, everyone in the um, photonic crystal cavity will always prefer the very high Q. What's the main advantage? Why would be the advantage of having a very high Q? In the in, in the photonic crystal. For some applications, you wouldn't even want to have a very high Q. Um, I mean, the, the, the advantage of photonic crystal cavities is a small mode volume. That's the, the main, main uh, advantage. And for some applications, I mean, I showed you a bunch of experiments with cavity quantum electrodynamics with quantum dot. Q factors were not ultra high. They were around 20,000. And in fact, for laser also, you don't want to have ultra high Q factor because it would slow down your, your device. It would also mean that you are radiating slower and less outside. So you want to operate in the regime of Qs of few tens of thousands. But for some applications, like nonlinear optics, we talked about Raman laser last time, you want to have high Q. Right. And the reason I showed you a result from the same group with Raman laser where they reduced threshold dramatically in silicon, they used exactly these cavities that had small volume and high Q factor because the threshold for those effects goes as Q factor squared divided by mode volume. I see. Yeah. So increasing Q and reducing volume helps. But you know, keep in mind, it's not always helping. Although to reach strong coupling regime of cavity QED, you have to increase Q somewhat, right? So you can't really do it with Q of few hundred you need ten, few tens of thousands, but you don't need millions. I see. Yeah. Okay. All yeah. right. Okay. Thank you, folks. I'll see you all on Tuesday. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.